Wonderful. Well, welcome everyone to another episode of Students Against Mandates podcast. Our hosts today are myself, Sheldon Monroe, and Camille Batucci. Our guest today is the esteemed Dr. Scott Atlas. Dr. Atlas was a professor, professor of, and chief of neuroradiology at Stanford University Medical Center in California. Atlas received his Bachelor of Science degree in biology from the University of Illinois and his MD from the University of Chicago. Dr. Atlas has worked at some of the best medical centers in the United States, the University of Pennsylvania, University of Chicago, and of course, Stanford University. Dr. Atlas is a senior fellow at the Hoover Institute and in 2020 joined tr the Trump administration as an advisor on COVID. Dr. Atlas is now the host of Independent Truths with Scott Atlas, a show that he investigates the role of government, the private sector in healthcare quality, and access, global trends in healthcare innovation, the key economic and civil liberty issues related to health policy. Dr. Atlas, we are so thrilled to have you on our show today. Welcome. Well, thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Just one clarification. I was a professor at the School of Medicine yes. and quit in 2012. So, okay. uh, and the reason that's important is because I'm full-time health policy for mm -hmm. more than a dozen years. And that, that's very important to understand in terms of the COVID fiasco, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. one of the, you know, one of the obvious but unstated facts is that this is a health policy issue, the management mm -hmm. of a pandemic, mm -hmm. not a, an issue for to be run by an epidemiologist or a virologist. Mm -hmm. It's health policy. I'm full-time health policy. And uh, the, the one of the most you know, repeated nonsensical criticisms was, oh, this guy's a radiologist. What does he know? This is not a question about epidemiology or anything else specific in basic science. This is a question of health policy. There mm -hmm. was nobody working on health policy that was advising the president of the United States. Mm -hmm. That's, yes. well, that's a sad, uh, sad truth and we can get into any of that. Well, thank you for that clarification. Clarification, part of me, and we we do have some questions oriented towards that coming up. So, I'll let Camille take it from there. Well, uh, we'll, we'll hop right in here. Um, so, in August of 2020, you became President Trump's COVID advisor. Um, we just want to know what the role entailed, what kind of questions President Trump was asking you, and what your responsibilities were um, in that role. Well, I was uh, working on the pandemic since end of February on my own uh, at Stanford because the response was completely nonsensical, locking up all the low risk people and not doing enough to protect the high risk people. And the strategy was a gross failure and destructive and literally killing people, uh, meaning the lockdowns and then the ultimately the school closures, et cetera. And uh, this was shocking. So I was working on it, doing research uh, writing about it, doing some interviews. And then I was called in July of 2020 by the uh, White House and asked this very simple question. We, we'd like you to come in. Would you speak to the president? So I'm an American. Uh, it's my country. People were dying. The president was embarked, embarking and the country was embarking on completely incorrect health policy. It, but, uh, you know, I, of course, anyone who's sane would go in to try to help his country and at least speak to the president. So in July 2020, uh, mid to late 2020, I went in and spent the day speaking to a variety of people, the president, the vice president, the chief of staff of the president, uh, you know, Jared Kushner, all the people you've heard of. And at the end of the day, I was asked uh, by Jared Kushner, which you, we would like you to help advise the president. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, but I just want to make sure this, it, you know, that that's great. Uh, but I just want to make sure you understand what you're getting here, because I'm not going to change my mind about something just because someone tells me to, I'm not going to sign on to some group statement just because other people want me to. I'm not going to agree with somebody, including the president, if he's wrong. And Kushner said, well, that's exactly why we want you. And I've related this story many times in, in my book, too, because this is verbatim what happened. This stuff is sort of indelible, uh, as you would imagine. 
He said, well, that's exactly why we want you. And I said, that's great. And then the next sentence was, but they're going to destroy you once this becomes public. Mm -hmm. They meaning the media. Remember the timing of this whole thing of the campaign was uh, was embarking for president of the United States. We had the most uh, divided country in my lifetime, mm -hmm. very hateful media. Mm -hmm. And I already knew this, but he said, the, they're going to destroy you. And I said, well, that doesn't sound so good because A, I, you know, I, I'm not a political person, uh, and you know, I'm 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 not in I'm not interested in becoming one. I wasn't interested in working in Washington D.C. I, I just was there for one reason: people were dying, and the wrong policies were in place. Mm -hmm. So uh, I said, "Well, let's try to do this from. I'm going to go back to California, mm -hmm. and we'll do it from there because I'm not insane. I don't want to be destroyed." Uh, in the press, and I thought, okay, so I'll stay home and do it distance wise, but it just doesn't work after two or three days, of course. Uh, you know, remember the country, the world was in panic mode. The president is being fed completely wrong information by people who are literally mm -hmm. just incompetent. Mm -hmm. uh, whether or not they were famous or had a long list of titles is not how you determine competence. And so, uh, yeah. I, I agreed to come back. And so I went to Washington as an advisor to the president with a temporary appointment of 120 days. That's a specific duration. I wasn't fired. I didn't quit out of anger. Uh, my time ran out and I was done at the end of uh, November. But in any event, I went back and I was asked to be, I was advising the president. And then I was also told, we want you to sit in on the White House Coronavirus Task Force. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I went in and said, well, I don't really want to go in the task force because there's no point. These people were in place for six months already. By the time I walked in the door, uh, the head of the task force with a woman named Dr. Uh, Deborah Burks, mm -hmm. who was the head of the medical side of the task force. Fauci, Dr. Fauci was the most visible public face of the task force, but he wasn't in charge of anything. He's the mm -hmm. most influential. Uh, Vice President Pence was the head of the entire task force, but just running it, sort of running the meetings. And then the other side of the task force, besides the medical side, was the logistics, mm -hmm. uh, which was totally separate. Uh, this had to do with emergency management of equipment and personnel and the apparatus involved in all the other aspects of this. So uh, I sat in on the task force and advise the president. And by advising the president, if I can go on, uh, what does that mean? OK, that means informally uh, answering his questions uh, you know, in person, uh, also being involved in uh, his remarks to the public. He was, at the time, uh, he, I didn't, if, if people don't remember, I'll refresh their memory, he, would, he had stopped doing press conferences, press briefings about mm -hmm. COVID. Uh, and I came in, at, and this is now end of July, August 1st, and said, my suggestion was, okay, that's not a good idea to stop the press conference. You, ha you yeah. should not only reinstate them, but you should reinstate them and you have to deliver in personally the data because mm -hmm. the people are afraid and most people were even more fearful because they thought, oh, he he's not even aware of what's going on. He doesn't care what's going on. And I my idea was, even if you don't know what to do, make sure you at least, you know, say what's going on to the public, mm -hmm. because uh, one of the main roles, of course, as a, of a leader is to allay fear, not to mm -hmm. stoke fear, not to increase fear but to you know, help the public understand, yeah. we know what's going on, these are the facts. And so uh, I helped prepare his remarks. And then I, uh, once it became public, uh, which was an ad hoc decision of his to just say, hey, you, he said, you wanna just go out there with me? I said, yeah. okay. Uh, so, uh, and so I answered the questions from the press at the press briefings that were pertinent to COVID. Thank you for that, that thorough and, and eloquent answer there. So you, back to the professional background, because you mentioned that earlier, and it's, and it's worthwhile really um, rediscussing and analyzing there. So your professional background, as you say, is an expert in public health policy, but also that you have been a practicing doctor. You have actually been a, a 
treating patients before. Now that shift away from from the academic institutes, of course, the um, you working in, in the hospital setting, to a more of a bureaucratic environment. What were some of the major challenges that you went through with that shift there, and did you notice any? Well, so let me just clarify. My background is uh, I went to medical school at University of Chicago. I did a my residency and was chief resident at Northwestern University in diagnostic radiology. I did my neuroradiology fellowship, which involves procedures and diagnostic uh, imaging uh, at University of Pennsylvania. And then I was assistant professor, associate professor, and full professor uh, at the variety of medical centers in the United States. I was a medical scientist I have over a hundred peer reviewed papers in scientific journals. I've been funded with grants, peer reviewed grants over 30 times. Uh, I have given 600 plus invited professor lectures at every top medical center in the country. And uh, so I was in medical science for 25 years. I wasn't just a practicing doctor in some community practice. I was never involved in, uh, in non-academic medical centers, tertiary care medical centers. So I was in my, I was a clinician, I was doing research and I was teaching other doctors and training. I've trained over a hundred uh, subspecialist uh, doctors uh, who are positioned in a variety of positions all over the world. Mm -hmm. Then for also, I had an overlap of doing health policy and I've been doing health policy for over a decade full-time at Hoover Institution. Mm -hmm which is a research institute uh, at Stanford uh, University that uh, researches, and my role was researching and devising healthcare policy, mm -hmm. which is integrating all the information about uh, the healthcare system, about delivery of care, about innovation, about medical uh uh, you know, medical technology, as well as about best outcomes for patients and uh, taking into account the actual health care uh, and combining it with economics and et cetera for the consequences of health policy. And that is critical to understand because health policy itself, uh, public health policy is designed to deliver the best medical care, but it matter the policy consequences are relevant. It's not just yeah. uh, shutting down a disease at all costs. I mean, you could line up everybody against the wall and shoot them in the head and mm -hmm. you'd stop COVID, but we don't do that mm -hmm. because there's a downside mm -hmm. to killing everybody to stop COVID. Uh, and that sounds sort of glib, but the reality is that they did kill people yeah. trying to stop cases of COVID. So when I went into the White House, I, I had been uh, very uh, commonly, I mean, I've testified to Congress pre-COVID before anything to do with the pandemic. Uh, I've been asked to testify in front of Congress. I've been a consultant to a variety of uh, private companies, but also uh, to people in government. Uh, I've advised many people who are in Congress, the House of Representatives, the Senate, mm -hmm. I've also advised many people running for president. I've advised people uh, on health committees in Congress, et cetera, et cetera. So um, in a sense, I was uh, used to, I am used to integrating all the information mm -hmm. uh, and advising people in a, and not just what to do, but how to even think about things and how to articulate mm -hmm. things because mm -hmm. Uh, you have to be able to articulate uh, things and, and distill technical information into sort of bullet point uh, mm -hmm. yeah. understandable yeah. phrases. Mm -hmm. Remember, the people in government are laymen. And mm -hmm. what I mean by that is not to be, not, it's not a derogatory word, it's the reality is that mm -hmm. they're not, uh, they, they can't know everything. No one mm -hmm. can. Uh, that's why they have advisors of multiple different fields and multiple different advisors on each field. Mm -hmm. But secondly, uh, they they need to know, first you need to explain and you need to ex be able to explain and teach um, complicated information and distill it into uh, actionable policies. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, you know, it, it's sort of, uh, it's a certain kind of a uh, task to do this, but I, I had been used to doing it. What I wasn't used to, what I was a neophyte on was the uh, 
you know, the the hyper uh, aggressive, vicious, frankly, mm -hmm. uh, and self-centered uh, people in government who do not have either the top level uh, knowledge nor the integrity and selflessness that you would hope they would do. That's mm -hmm. my experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we had highly incompetent people mm -hmm. advising the president of the United States, grossly incompetent people yeah. who, uh, you know, uh, were just not prepared, were not knowledgeable, had no real evidence of critical thinking whatsoever. Uh, and uh, also they had their own motivations, which I can expound on. But basically these are people I was very naive. Uh, you know, I, I, I wasn't aware. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of, even after this, I'm still sort of shocked, but also uh, I still retain a little bit of idealism. You're supposed to be a good person. Uh, you're supposed to, when, when you're helping the president of your country in a crisis, uh, you're not supposed to be worried about covering your behind. You're not supposed to be worried about your position. You're supposed to tell the truth no matter what, and do the best possible job you can uh, and not be political, not be uh, going to the media, not be trying to undermine people. And if you don't like uh, doing that, you should get out. You, you shouldn't just keep going, uh, which is what I saw other people do. So uh, it, it's again, like a long-winded answer because, uh, you know, and it, it, it's, it's just it's still shocking to even think about it every time somebody asks. But um, there's a lot of people in positions of power that are grossly inept and have no integrity whatsoever. And that, that's a very negative way to say it, but that's the truth. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you for that, 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 that answer, Noah. I much, much appreciate it. It also seems, too, that just as an addition to that question, that it seems that there is a, a lack of an ability to, to run a, a thorough cost-benefit analysis, at least receive one from a, a public perspective. Did you find being as a doctor there, or, or even in radiology, pardon me, going in and, and seeing how something like lockdowns could really affect perhaps low-income families? I mean, that lack of uh, ability to access uh, uh, um, checkups and, and, and medical appointments has, has a, a long-lasting cas cascading effect on, on these other um, groups in society. Well, I mean, there was no a concern, frankly, or understanding by these other people, Dr. Fauci, Dr. Burks, and the entire medical side of the task force. And in addition, I will include the so-called experts from Americas and other uh, countries, universities, scientists. They had no clue what they were talking about because they never cared about the consequences of the policy itself, which is what you're alluding to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a separate issue of lack of knowledge about how respiratory uh, viruses and the absolute uh, impossibility that lockdowns were going to stop the spread of the infection and the lack of uh, common sense to understand that you don't kill and destroy young people children and poor people trying to stop an infection that the 99% of people uh, don't have a significant problem mm -hmm. from. But uh, the, the big issue you're getting at is the, what I find is one of the most uh, flagrant breaches of morality of an ethical society. And that is shifting the burden of a disease to the poor people and sheltering the affluent. Uh, they, they didn't do the analysis. They didn't know what they were talking about. And I, this is one of the big reasons, uh, the big sins, really. Uh, uh, we, as, a, as Western civilizations, uh, declared low-income people that, as the essential workers, had them uh, deliver our food and uh, work in the grocery store and clean the... Uh, the hospital floors, uh, et cetera, while the affluent sat at home and worked on their laptops yeah. and mm -hmm. ordered in. And this was unconscionable, really immoral. Uh, but beyond that, uh, the results are the results for this. So mm -hmm. the school closures, there is massive learning loss, all documented. If you look at the World Bank, UNICEF, UN reports, all documented to have destroyed poor kids mm -hmm. far more 
than uh, than affluent and middle class and upper middle class kids. Mm -hmm. the The school closures were not the only issue. Uh, but by the way, it's not just the learning loss of school closures that affect lower income families. Poor kids get their most nutritious meals in school. Mm -hmm. OK, uh, you know that poor kids uh, and low income family kids uh, get their uh, visual or hearing problems detected in school. When you close schools, they can't get these things. Low income families have no possible way really to to uh, work with their neighbors who are like where I live at Stanford in California. Uh, you know, everybody's got a PhD or an MD and you get this little micro school with your neighbors and you have a better school than you had. Uh, but that doesn't happen. That's not reality for, for most people. It obviously outside the United States, but certainly even inside the United States. And, uh, you know, the shutdowns and lockdowns cause massive unemployment and the economic, severe economic downturns aren't just economic, they kill people. This has been known for decades in the economics of the, the deaths of despair, massive rises in, in alcoholism, drug abuse, mm -hmm. child abuse, spousal abuse, mm -hmm. and also death. And in fact, there's a study from end of 2020 by Bianchi and colleagues, if you wanna look it up, mm -hmm. that projects that there's gonna be over a million extra deaths uh, in the United States from the unemployment alone. This has nothing to do with the virus. This is the lockdown, over a million extra deaths predominantly impacting Afri African-Americans and women. Okay, we're supposed to be a country, I thought, that, that cares about poor people, that is constantly mouthing off about how we care about minorities, yet we destroyed yeah. poor people yeah. and minorities. Uh, without even caring, with sheltering the affluent uh, as the elite affluent are sitting there demanding more and more lockdowns uh, that were failing, by the way, to protect the high risk people that were the elderly and feeble in the nursing homes. Mm -hmm. The policies were failures. And yeah, I just want to reemphasize this. Uh, it was known since 2006 and the papers are written by the people that were credited with eradicating smallpox. Uh, in 2006, so for 15 years, lockdowns for viral respiratory infections, A, do not work, and B, in, in, inflict severe harms on society. That was known. It wasn't learned in 2020 or 2021 or 2022. Yeah. It was known. And it was also known for decades that severe economic downturns mm -hmm. kill people, kill people not just are inconvenient, not just are, uh, you know, minor uh, problems or even important, uh, you know, economic issues, they kill people. Mm -hmm. And so the policy, mm -hmm. the lockdowners got what they wanted. They got the lockdowns, they got the school closures. They didn't just destroy young people, they killed people, mm -hmm. they did that. Yeah. Now, I, assu I assume you brought this up, um, in your time uh, in Washington, you know, advising the president on on the COVID task force, what was the response when when bringing up the, you'd say the negatives, uh, if if that's a if that's not an understatement, or the downside of these lockdowns? Did did anyone did anyone care or, or yeah, what was it? The way the meetings worked uh, in the task force, uh, as well as there was another uh, regularly occurring COVID meeting. It was bigger group was that there'd be an agenda and I would come in and, you know, I'm, uh, I'm used to working at places where you walk in and there's a bunch of other smart people. So you better be prepared and you win the argument on the basis of knowing more and you're prepared. And I walked in, let's just say there was a, on the agenda, a risk to children and vice president Pence would turn to me and say, what do you think? And so I would go through, I had two dozen scientific papers, printouts of all the recent data. I had discussed all the papers with a bunch of world-class scientists, epidemiologists, et cetera, beforehand. I was completely prepared. And I would give five to 10 minutes citing the data and the papers, the studies, the current studies. There was not a single meeting where Burks or Fauci or any other doctor had a single scientific paper in a task force meeting, none, zero. Wow. 
And so I would give my reply. And at the end, for instance, in this example, Vice President Pence turned to Fauci and Burks. What do you think? Silence. Nothing. They never had a single wow. scientific fact or piece of data to refute anything I said. The only thing that was said was by Burks, who, whose answer to all of this was simply, Scott, you're an outlier. Okay, <laughs> I'm an outlier. Okay, that's not a scientific rebuttal. Right. That's not a rebuttal of a person who's prepared. That's not a rebuttal of somebody who knows what they're doing. Uh, and so it's an, uh, it's an ad that, hominem. That's, that, that's yeah. one of the one of the responses I'll give you. The other one is something that illustrates what happened. I wrote about this in my book also. I figured that, OK, I got there July 30, 31st, something like this. And I thought, OK, what one of the things I need to do is to get people who are actually experts who are doing the research and thinking through the pandemic in a critical way, world-class people, not bureaucrats. Burks and Fauci were bureaucrats for decades. They, it's a joke to see pictures of any of either of them on like wearing a white coat. I mean, this is insane. These people are bureaucrats. Uh, they're not scientists. They don't think like scientists. They don't, they're not physicians. They don't think like physicians. They run groups of bureaucratic organizations. But in any event, I, I thought, okay, what, what can I do is I could bring in people and answer the president's questions. Mm -hmm. And so I, I brought in and arranged people from coast to coast, UCLA, Tufts Medical Center, Harvard, Stanford. Uh, and we had five of us arranged to go and talk to the president. And the day before, and this was arranged so that Burks would be able to attend. And uh, the day before, 24 hours before, she sends an email saying she's not going to the meeting. So I get called in by Jared Kushner, and I'm told the meeting is canceled. Okay, and this is in August of 2020. And I said, wait a second. First of all, I was shocked, and I, I, I sort of went ballistic uh, because people were dying, remember. We have buffoons advising the president, complete uh wrong completely wrong information they're killing people with their advice uh and so i said and also i had these people were already on their way some of them were in the air on mm -hmm. airplanes and i and they're doing me a favor and the country a favor mm -hmm. to come and so i said well no and i i i insisted in the in vehemently insisted that this is going to happen this meeting mm -hmm. no matter what i said and so jared kushner was Fine. He said, OK, you're right. We'll have the meeting, but it's going to be five minutes. Just a hello, quote unquote. Five meetings, just a hello in the Oval Office. So at this point, I said, OK, because, you know, uh, what, what am I going to say? At least we're going to be there. And so we we go in, the five of us, right in front of the president in the Oval Office. And President Trump starts asking he asked me, OK, Scott, what 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 is this? And I introduced the five people, including myself. Uh, and uh, then he starts asking questions. He goes around person by person, asks very good questions. Uh, OK, he wanted to know the information. That's the point of an advisor. Give the information, answers questions. Uh, and so uh, he had a lot of questions and he asked all the good questions. And um, he kept going for 45 minutes to an hour. And I kept being tapped on the back. And Burks didn't come. She refused to come. And, and again, like there's so many things to say about this. But number one, obviously, if you know what you're talking about, you shouldn't be afraid to come. Mm -hmm. That's point number one. Point number two is science is about discussing and critically thinking through and debating the data to derive the truthful conclusion. If you yeah. can't do that, if you refuse to do that, you're not a scientist. You don't know how to be a scientist. Uh, and uh, and it was very, uh, it was shocking uh, that she refused to come. Uh, but, you know, obviously she was intimidated by people who, uh, who knew a lot, I guess. Um, and then, uh, you know, the other part, part to make here is that 
this was kept silent from the public. There was never a press release. There was never a discussion with the press. There was never a Q and A, which I had hoped there would be, because you know we we want to show the public that okay, there there is actual information being given to the president. You don't have to freak out and panic because mm -hmm. panic is a very destructive emotion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and this would have been reassuring to the American public that the president of the United States was listening to top medical scientists, epidemiologists, infectious disease experts, health policy experts about what's happening real time. But no, they kept it silent. Uh, and I was told many times internally in the White House, stop talking to the press, stop making waves. We have an election coming up. Mm -hmm which again is another level of shock and disgust, frankly, to me, because people are dying. I said, they said, stop rocking the boat. I said, the boat is already capsized. Yeah. I don't care about rocking the boat. People are dying. Mm -hmm. I don't care about an election. And so I continued to speak. Yeah, well well said. Um, and a really interesting point you bring up there, which I'm, I'm sure that was part of that team there advising the president without Burks being there, would have been an aspect of which we'd be remiss if we didn't ask about, is, is really emphasizing and understanding the risk of death. Because I know here in Canada, it was over the median age of death, about 83 in Canada here. And, uh, you know, it's pretty basic uh, first or second year quantitative analysis, you understand median age and, and what role that plays, particularly in relation to, to statistics, pardon me. So for yourself, was that a large uh, portion of, of your discussion points with President Trump is this is what the risk of death is and, and how that will play into well, fear? Sure. I mean, the, the, it was known from early from the earliest data, including the Japanese cruise ship where the first infection was first uh, sort of uh, discussed in any detail, uh, that there was a uh, thankfully, that there was this incredibly <laughs> steep uh, age gradient of risk of death. And what I mean by that is that people who were old had thousands fold higher risk of dying than people who were young. And in fact, even from the early data all over the world, including uh, the CDC of the United States, the risk of dying for somebody under 20 was something uh, like 0.0003% uh, or something like this. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a very low risk for anyone under 70, really. Uh, and it was a, it turned out, and you're pointing out something important, in many countries, the median age of death from COVID was older than the median age of life expectancy. That doesn't minimize that people died from COVID, mm -hmm. by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, and then nobody's trying to minimize that. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it's also important to know this, that two-thirds of deaths were in people over 65, that two-thirds of deaths were in people that had greater than or equal to six comorbidities, six underlying illnesses. Mm -hmm. So older people who are healthy were not at massively high risk. It was only people who had significant underlying illnesses. And that underlying illness issue was, a, was another distortion, by the way, in the media, in a, a completely un, 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 uh, un, unacknowledged and misunderstood thing inside the White House by the people in the task force. Uh, they really, they didn't even know. I kept trying to show them the epidemiology papers that showed that not all risk factors are equal, okay? And what I mean by that is many, many people have high blood pressure. High blood pressure alone was not a significant risk factor. This was in the data, but you had to have a brain and a critically thinking scientific understanding of how to look at data to see that it's different uh, to have obesity as a risk factor versus, which is a significant risk factor versus treated high blood pressure alone. Secondly, it was multiple comorbidities that were necessary to put you in the high risk category. Uh, so, so there was a lot of problems. I, I want to mention something that reminds me, when I say that people weren't critical thinkers in the task force, I'm talking about the medical people. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is the following, and, and anybody in your audience who is in who has taken AP biology in high school, 
would understand this. When you look at a scientific research paper, when you're trying to assess it, you don't just sit there and read the conclusion and say, oh, okay, uh, which is what I saw happening in, in, the, in the task force people. What you do is you look at the study design. I review papers. I've been on the editorial boards and editors of medical journals. I've reviewed NIH grants for my whole career. You look at the study design. If the study design is flawed significantly, mm -hmm. then the results have mm -hmm. no meaning, zero. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. care if the results are 100% conclusive, mm -hmm. consistent. If the study design is incorrect, then the results are to be discarded. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that they have no idea what they, what they were doing. And there are so many examples of that. But I just want to say that the ingredient here is critical thinking and common sense. You don't have to be a scientist to be a critical thinker. But if you're going to say you're a scientist or be a scientist, you better be a critical thinker. <laughs> Otherwise, you're just totally incompetent. And that's what I saw. Well, I mean, one thing that shocked me, at least, and I, I don't come from a STEM background at all. Uh, my father and my brother, they, they're engineers, but and, and they agree with me on this point. The abandonment of the scientific method throughout the pandemic is is something that blew me away um and and when when you mentioned earlier that Burks didn't didn't want to go to the meeting i mean a part of the scientific method for me is being able to substantiate and argue your points um if if you aren't willing and and able and willing to mm -hmm. to, to argue in favor of your of your 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 opinion or your science, your medical opinion I mean, what, what value does it hold? I, I, I found that a lot of the suits that were involved in the, in the process of, of managing the, the, the COVID fiasco were, were, were busy pointing fingers and, and, and name calling, were more busy pointing fingers and name calling than they were substantiating their, their opinions. So, so just, to, just to go back to your point, I mean, yeah, the, the, the scientific method throughout COVID was just was, was obsolete. It, it just wasn't there. Yeah, it, it wasn't there. There was no critical thinking. And, and I, I have to say there, there were other things, too. There was frank denial of basic biology. OK, uh, it's known that uh, protection, biological protection, and you could say the word immunity if you want, immunologic protection against a viral infection occurs in respiratory viruses. Uh, and it occurs and is long lasting uh that's point number one point number two is for people who know anything about biology uh in a moderately uh, advanced level your immune protection is not just in the antibodies in your blood test because you have long lasting immunity in your bone marrow and in your lymph nodes and so you have what are called b cells and t cells that are memory based uh and you know why is this important well, it's important for so many reasons, including the fact that uh, this was denied, even though it's basic biology. I mean, this is literally AP high school biology, mm -hmm. what we call AP in the United States, advanced placement. I don't know what they call it in Canada, but uh, it's really not more than freshman year college. You don't have to be an epidemiologist or an MD or a PhD. Uh, you just have to have taken some biology to understand this stuff. Secondly, they were testing people and saying, oh, you're still at risk. Redfield, the head of the CDC at the time when I was there, uh, made this gross error, didn't, didn't seem to understand basic biology uh, on the level of this. Uh, and then also, uh, you know, that, that, that data was, was true for COVID. And how do, what do I mean? Back in the summer of 2020, one of the many things that was not understood by, it should have been widely publicized, there was a study done on old blood uh, from SARS-1. And they took SARS-2 virus and put it into that. And they showed that there was a significant immune reaction, immune response. Now, why is that important? Because A, it was many, many years later. So it shows that there's a, in coronaviruses, this family of viruses, there was a long-term immune protection. Number two, it showed that there was cross-reactivity of other coronaviruses with this coronavirus. Uh, okay, so this whole 
one of the main things that made people afraid, oh, this is a new virus, a novel virus. No one has any immunological protection. That was false. That was completely false. That was a lie. Uh, and it was poorly uh, transmitted. Yet the people that pro pretend to be experts, I'm talking about at the, at the best university medical centers in the country, including Stanford University infectious disease people, uh, somehow, uh, you know, forgot that uh, the most basic level of biology and denied it. And there were other denials uh, of, of biology that were done. And there was denial of the actual data on this virus, the data that there was a consistent pattern of the infection would come in. And then after a few weeks, it would start going down, no matter what you did. It had nothing to do yeah. with the masks, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And we also knew, by the way, if you want to talk about it at all, uh, that masks don't work to protect people from viral respiratory infections, and they don't work to stop the spread from people with virus, viral respiratory infections that, that are spread by breathing. Uh, so, you know, this was all known, it was all denied, and uh, we're left with a society where people, therefore, have no trust in the scientific community, they have diminished trust in public health, and now we're at a, at a point where we're supposed to have objective societies uh, and we have most people don't know where to turn for truth. That's one of the legacies mm -hmm. of the uh, people who led the public health effort in your country and my country is that their incompetence, their lack of acknowledgement of error, and their complete uh, misguided thinking, completely misguided thinking, have destroyed the trust in very important uh, institutions and guidelines for regular citizens. Absolutely. And uh, you know what, that, that just makes me think of, of uh, I think it was a quote from December 2020. You see Fauci go on TV and saying, in, in order to, to dispel the, this rumor that you could get natural immunity from, from COVID, especially in young people, mm -hmm. saying the vaccine is a dead end for COVID. Obviously, that was not true. I mean, we saw greater spikes after people got vaccinated because they weren't able to develop the natural immunity from and, and I don't know what you're, if I'm right or wrong here, but for me, the lockdowns played a big part in that because people were unable to actually contract the virus. So it's, it made, it made the, the pandemic exponentially longer than it should have been. Um, but uh, well, one, that, of, that's one of the things you, you're pointing out something I, I, that, that's, that's important about uh, some of the statements that were made about the vaccines. I mean, this is another good example. There was never any data that showed that the vaccines prevent the spread of infection after, after several weeks. And in fact, it showed the opposite. The data uh, not only showed that you, you get reinfected after several weeks, and it continues to, it had continued to show that, uh, but it also showed that the biological protection against serious illness or death or reinfection this is in, say, mid-2021, the earliest data was from Israel, was superior. The protection was superior in people who had COVID and never got vaccinated than people who never had COVID and got vaccinated. And so uh, just, you know, people were never informed. People were grossly misinformed. Uh, right. Or lied to, I don't know. Lying means you understand the motivation. Uh, so we know they were certainly misinformed. And we had people who were grossly incompetent. At the time. We still have people who are grossly incompetent, as you know. Um, and, you know, this is a real problem because, again, they're, they're, they're in power, a lot of these people. Yeah. And uh, they're, they're incompetent. Uh, they should never be trusted to have any kind of authority whatsoever uh, in any serious situation. And they won't admit they were wrong, which is even worse because as as I know, as somebody older than you guys, uh, one of the first things that you need to do to restore trust in people who you care about is when you're wrong, you admit you were wrong. If you can't admit you were wrong, you don't deserve any trust. And, and uh, frankly, the, the trust is really broken uh, to a great extent and it's deservedly so. It's the break in trust is deserved. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that that kind of leads me to my next question here. So I think I think we all you know we know who who Anthony Fauci is. Um, so he's been you know praised as a savior by 
by many people on one side, dragged through the mud by by others, including myself. But uh, you know, one thing that I was wondering, and I think I think many people do wonder this, is what role did Fauci actually have with regards to the policy and decision making? I mean, I, I can see both sides. I, I mean, I don't know if I guess what I'm asking was was he a scapegoat or did he actually have the the, the necessary power to influence public policy on these matters? Well, he had massive power to influence public policy. I mean, that here, here's the the situation was that um, Fauci wasn't in charge of anything. He's the head of the infectious disease part of the NIH, uh, but he had massive power both in terms of being the senior person in charge of funding all academic science grants that stem from NIH uh, in infectious disease and therefore politically very powerful because you can imagine all the academic science communities uh, careers depend on getting NIH grants in the United States yeah. and many other countries. So you're not going to necessarily feel good about criticizing the person who, who is a really can destroy your career. That's sort of part of the power. The second though, is that he was advisor and publicly visible. He was on TV and in podcasts and on the media more than anybody probably in the history of, of government service, quote unquote, uh, but uh, and that was all done, you know, by himself and his his own getting himself out there. So whether or not he had the authority, he had massive influence, uh, mm -hmm. and he had influence not just in the United States but worldwide. Because when the head of the infectious disease branch of the United States NIH recommends X then most people defer to that. And that's what happened worldwide. And also he was, uh, you know, right on stage with President Trump for months. And uh, before I got there, I'm sorry, I didn't get there till August of 2020. Uh, they mm -hmm. were in place since February of 2020. So they were already embarked on the grossly erroneous policies for five months. But so massive influence. Now, authority is something else. Literal Literally, the word authority, uh, that was appropriated to people like Fauci and Burks and in other countries, they had their own people, by a massive failure of leadership of the people who had the authority. Who had the authority? Well, in the United States, the president and the governors of the states and the local health officials are the ones who make the rules. Uh, not Fauci. Okay, not not Burks. And so it's it's actually true that Fauci didn't put a padlock on the school door. Fauci didn't have the power to shut down anything. He recommended. Yeah. Them. So he had massive influence. But the people who did the implementation of the Burks Fauci lockdowns are the people who were elected to be in charge and who were appointed to be in charge. So when New York City lock, put padlocks on its playgrounds outdoors and forced people to stay indoors where the cases spread. They don't spread mainly outdoors. They spread indoors. It was proven early on. The people putting the padlocks was the mayor de Blasio of New York City. He has responsibility. When Cuomo ordered the test positive SARS virus patients to be re-put back into the nursing homes, that's his authority, okay? He did that. Uh, the people, Governor Newsom of California, who shut down schools in California and had the most protracted duration of school closures in the United States, were in the fall of 2020, roughly 15% of public school students in K through 12 were in person he did that, okay? The lockdowners who had the authority did that. They killed people with their actions. They destroyed children. They did that. They owned that. Fauci recommended that. Burks recommended that. They had massive influence. Burks, just to clue your listeners in here, when I say she was head of the task force, by the way, she wrote all of the official federal guidance to all the states. She personally wrote it. Whether Trump said stuff or not on stage, whether I as an advisor said stuff, no one listened to that. 
So the, the yeah. book we listened to was the written guidance on White House stationery to the states from the White House Coronavirus Task Force, which was the official federal policy, and that was run by Deborah Burks. So uh, she and Fauci have massive uh, responsibility for what was done. But if you want to be uh, literally true, they didn't have the power to order things. They, they recommended that things were ordered, and they were ordered by the people. So there was a massive failure of leadership is what I'm getting at. And you can't escape that. Uh, you, meaning one, cannot escape that there was a massive failure in leadership in front of, of the people elected to protect our citizens. Mm -hmm. And just to, to shift things a little bit towards the, the universities, as they played such an interesting role in, in, in this entire fiasco, like Camille has said, with esteemed professors such as Martin Kordoff just recently being let go of, of his academic institution and, and others who've been let go from their respective academic institutions, do you feel that there is a hope in, in, in reclaiming um, the quality we once had in our academic institutions? Well, let me let me uh, first frame what happened in the university system. Um, university professors are given, granted, massive uh, prominence and authority and respect in, in our countries. Uh, professors and university uh, people are deemed experts by, by everybody. They are deemed the experts on TV news and commentary. They are deemed the experts by government in appointing people. They are often uh, the people who are the heads of agencies and government. So they are automatically given respect by virtue of their titles. And I just want to parenthetically yeah. say that the era of trusting peoples on the basis of their title alone is over. We have massive exposure of gross incompetence and uh, unethical behavior by people with fancy titles. So we have to we have to realize that and and sort of uh, understand that we have individual responsibility. But the second part here, more specifically, was the university people were the talking heads on the news, and they were grossly inept, uh, emotional, fearful people, I, I feel probably uh, is one of the only explanations for their gross incompetence. And they they uh, they embarked on censorship. And I think we need to talk about censorship uh, quite a bit here because that was a big part of how universities uh, function. Uh, wh what do I mean by censorship? Well, censorship is not just putting a physical muzzle on somebody or firing them. OK, censorship is defaming them, delegitimizing them, distorting what they said, writing op-ed pieces, claiming that they were, uh, quote, uh, analogous to the Tuskegee syphilis experiments or eugenics, um, claiming that what uh, censuring them, which was happened to me, had to happen to me at Stanford University. I had an official censure. Uh, even though they had no no uh, no specific thing about what I said that was wrong. In fact, I, I was 100% right. right about every single thing I said, for the record, 100% right. Uh, and they have to eat that for the rest of their careers, by the way. So uh, I just want to put that in there. Um, uh, you know, although my wife always tells me, don't punch down. So stop uh, criticizing Stanford University faculty. Uh, which is another sometimes it's hard to nice thing that <laughs> nice uh, way to put it but um the reality was that uh they they uh defamed that this is censorship because when you delegitimize people uh and you threat you know i had a lot of death threats i had the fbi involved in washington dc and in stanford i live in this community that's so safe yet i had to have 24 7 police security in my driveway and and in my cul-de-sac where I live, I had to install security cameras instigated by Stanford University's criticism of me, uh, in my opinion. Um, so th this is not something that uh, is going to be forgiven. Um, but uh, I just want to want to make it very clear that the censorship can be nuanced. OK, when you wh why is that? It's a very effective. Why is it effective? I well, I know it was effective because I had hundreds of emails from medical scientists, doctors, and health policy people all over the country saying, "Keep saying everything you're saying, Scott. You're right, but we're afraid to step forward. Mm -hmm. We're afraid for our jobs and our families." 
Okay, now that's an example of effective censorship because when I was sent part of censorship is cancel culture. And when mm -hmm. you uh, when you have vicious people like this, I mean, these are the lowest of the low, the people that said this stuff about me, including the people at Stanford, the lowest of the low, uh, zero integrity people. And uh, why do I, why, why was it effective? Because it makes other people afraid. So it causes self-cancellation. It causes self-censorship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you send, what is the effect of censorship? The effect of censorship is twofold. It stops people from talking. So it stops them, it shuts them up. It didn't, doesn't work on people like me because I just have a certain kind of personality mm -hmm. and I have a certain, I know what's, I know right from wrong. Okay, and this is one of the right. messages for the young people that are listening. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to do what's right, no matter what, no matter who, you know, uh, there's a Chesterton uh, uh, quote, uh, even if everybody else is wrong, you know, right is right and wrong mm -hmm. is wrong. And, and that's very important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, th this is just simply being a good person. I, I don't know how to even articulate that any better but um the other thing uh to know though is that censorship doesn't just stop the people from talking it stops everybody else from hearing it and that's the point of censorship that's the bigger point of censorship it stops the information from being known and when the information is not known widely it 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 makes it seem like a the people who say that information are are bizarre outliers. They're freaks. They're yeah. and they're dangerous. By the way, that's one of the ways that censorship was done, because it instills fear in everybody else. Those people are dangerous who say that masks don't work. Okay, masks don't work, but they said they were dangerous. So uh, that was a very uh, awful thing to do because it instilled fear. It also created massive division and hate in our societies. Yeah. But the second part of um, of censorship. Uh, was it created a false uh, idea that there was a consensus. Mm -hmm. And if everybody yeah. thinks there's a consensus, then maybe there's one person or two people like, like me, who early on, I was saying that the lockdowns should end and they were scientifically wrong as well as very harmful. I said that back in March of 2020. Okay, there were only three people that I know of in national media who said that, me, Johnny Anides, a Stanford epidemiologist, mm -hmm. uh, and David Katz, who wrote a piece in the New York Times. We all wrote something within a week in March of 2020 and repeatedly over and over again saying that the lockdowns were wrong and extremely harmful uh, and they were destroying people and we were not protect. We need to increase the protection of the higher risk elderly people because they were dying. The strategy was failing and yet the censorship and the demonization of those views caused people to believe that 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 the, the strategy that was imposed, the lockdowns was correct, that everybody agreed that the lockdowns were correct, false, false consensus. So the censorship uh, was very powerful. And it's, you know, the censorship had nuances. I mean, at Stanford, uh, if people or my colleagues were told, stop defending what Scott Atlas is saying. If they were told that by the boss, okay, that's a form of censorship. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, if people are, uh, you know, afraid of their own careers, that's a that's a form of censorship. And so it's 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 very uh, it's very problematic. We can't have a society. We don't have a free society in the mm -hmm. presence of censorship. Okay, what's yeah, worrisome yeah. to me is that people in your generation, generally, the polls show. They're somehow in favor of censoring, uh, you know, free speech. I mean, that's a disaster, uh, particularly in diverse societies where people, by definition, have different opinions. We need to have the way the truth is found is by debate and uh, discussion. The only solution to misinformation is more information. Mm -hmm. No one should trust anyone to determine truth and therefore filter the the. Uh, the divergent opinions on. No one should trust anybody to do that. Couldn't agree more. I mean, that really hits hits close to home mm -hmm. for, for Sheldon and I, and I know many of our listeners. Um, in Canada, the way that they would censor the opposing opinions, at least with regards to the student body, 
was by uh, enacting vaccine mandates and mask mandates and all these 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 crazy um, policies or restrictions. That for the, I know for the 2021-22 school year, um, I was personally kicked out of school for for refusing to provide my vaccination status. I, I, I thought that was an invasion of my privacy. I mean, I, I wouldn't have been able to provide it regardless, but my justification wasn't because I was unvaccinated. It was because they're not privy to that kind of information. And so they, they managed to get everyone who had this opinion out of the schools during the, during the you could say that the peak of, of the, I don't want to use words like indoctrination lightly, but I mean, to, to remove an entire category of people from, from even being able to enter the campus I mean, is, right. is, is crazy. And, 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 I mean, I don't know how, I mean, it was pretty successful in Canada. Like you said, like with, with the younger, the younger age groups, we, I, I mean, I don't, I don't claim to be a part of this, but there is, there's definitely a victim mentality, a parasitical mentality that, that allows people to to raise their hand and say, Oh, that hurt my feelings. I don't want to, I don't want to talk about this because, and I mean, it is a deflection because a lot of young people lack the knowledge, the experience to to speak, to speak on certain issues, but but the idea that you can raise your hand and say, "Oh, I'm offended," um, get this guy out of here is is ridiculous. I mean, it's dystopian yeah. to me. Um, yeah, so I'm it's sure you'd agree. Antithetical but... to the mission of universities, which are mm-hmm. supposed to be the centers for the free exchange of ideas. Uh, right. Let me just get back to the the vaccine mandates on campuses, if I can mention mm-hmm. this. So, mm-hmm. yeah, uh, you know, more than five thousand colleges and universities in the United States alone had vaccine mandates, and uh, this is. Um, this is one of the biggest outrages. All the people who are in charge of these universities should be fired. Every single one of them mm-hmm. should be fired. Yeah. And there should be a demand for them to be uh, fired or stepped down. Uh, because what they did was grossly unethical and yeah. completely uh, ant- antithetical to the data mm-hmm. on the risk to healthy children uh, mm-hmm. and people under 20. Uh, but, you know, it's sort of interesting historically to, to, to mention this. Um, back in October of 2020, the CDC had on its website on schools and testing, because this is before vaccines even existed, remember. The first vaccine uh, injection in the United States was December 16, 2020. Okay, so October 2020, there was no vaccine. CDC had on its website... It is unethical and, quote, quote, it is unethical and illegal to test students who don't want to be tested. That's basically what it said. And uh, we saw they, that they, 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 not only did they go against the testing illegality and lack of ethics that, that was known and generally accepted at, the point of, at that point in time, uh, they they went much further, of course, and isolated healthy students who tested positive, quarantining people, shutting down campuses, uh, sending test positive kids into the communities and back to their elderly parents, where the high risk population was, instead of the low risk environment mm-hmm. that is generally true on campus. Um, completely uh, things that lack common sense. Uh, and that are, again, denying the data uh, as if, like, the earth is flat. The people that did that yeah. are flat earthers. They're equivalent mm-hmm. to people who are sitting there claiming the earth is flat. That's their level of of competence and intelligence, frankly. Um, but this is a complete abrogation of ethics uh, to do that. Uh, and, of course, uh, this was superimposed on something else. Back in May, June... 2020, data had accumulated from the spring 2020 school closures that one in four college students contemplated killing himself. Mm-hmm. Okay, this is back in published by the CDC in July 2020. You could look it up. One in four college students thought of killing himself. There was an explosion of depression, anxiety. This is yeah. from the lockdowns, not the pandemic, not the virus. This is from the voluntary human policy of isolating young people. They did that. The lockdowners did that. And through 2020, the data was released in uh, approximately November 2020, December 2020, I forget. It was through 2020, 
there was an analysis of the medical claims in insurance. So it wasn't a survey, it was actual visits to doctors and what it showed for the, the lockdowns of 2020 in the United States, there was an explosion of uh, depression, anxiety disorder in teenagers in the United States compared to 2019, an explosion. There was a doubling to tripling of visits to doctors for self-harm. What is self-harm? Self-harm is putting cigarettes on your skin or slashing your wrist. This was double to triple in teenagers compared to 2019. There was an explosion of drug abuse, suicide, uh, no, uh, drug abuse and substance abuse disorders in college students and teenagers during the lockdowns of 2020 compared to 2019. There was an explosion of suicides in teenage girls in 2020 compared to 2019. So this is what they did. The isolation policy did that. The lockdowners did that. The university presidents and provosts, they did that. And we don't have any accountability for it. So it wasn't just this sort of, uh, I don't know how you would say it, but this sort of uh, idealistic freedom issue or which is very important, but uh, there were consequences to isolating young people, serious consequences. Mm -hmm. There are people that are dead because of that. Uh, people, we have seen only the tip of the iceberg of the damage of the lockdowns and school closures. I'll give you another figure to remember in the United States, 52% of college age kids had an unwanted weight gain during the lockdowns of 2020. And that weight gain averaged, uh, I think, 26 pounds. I forget the exact number. That's obesity. Yeah. That's obesity. Yeah, that's a lot. We have caused an obesity crisis in young people with the lockdowns. The lockdowners did that. The people in charge, they did that. <laughs> So just since, okay. since we we've um, got a got a frame here to work on with respect to time there, we're just going to ask one last question there, doctor. Given what you've seen transpire over the past few years, we, what advice would you give to young students who are, are facing this level of incompetence and who, who have gone through their own personal challenges, as we've just discussed, and who are still hoping to make a, a positive impact on, on public policy um, in, or, or politics? What, what advice could you give to someone like that? And, yeah, well, and just to add to that, sure. Oh, sorry, just to add to that, how how important do you think it is for for young students to make? And, and I know you spoke on this, but how important do you think it is for young students to maintain their integrity mm -hmm. when they're faced with you know professional and social repercussions that do that do impact their futures and 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 their present situations? Mm -hmm. I mean, whether they be students or or young professionals, um, how important do you think it is for them to maintain their integrity in the face of of, of pressure? Well, I mean, it's, uh, you know, uh, there's nothing more important. I, I speak on college campuses uh, fairly frequently, uh, and, you know, and I think that uh, we have a, we have a, there's a legacy here that, that we must overcome, uh, including uh, what was done specifically on college campuses and all the things that I, you know, that I mentioned here, but uh we need to, we, you know, what, what, what do we need to do? Uh, what, what the advice really is that uh, first, uh, you know, we, we need to maintain our own integrity. Okay, we have a disastrous void in courage in, in our countries. Mm -hmm. And uh, most alarmingly, unfortunately, at universities, which, uh, you know, among the many things that I mentioned that university professors do, one of them is they're automatically role models for students. I mean, mm -hmm. my own uh, yeah. children, uh, you know, they were raised to respect authority. And, you know, I think uh, we all admire and sort of take uh, what our college professors uh, and college leaders uh, say and do as, as a role model. Uh, and uh, I think this is a, this is a real problem. So, uh, you know, uh, one of the things to remember, I, I mentioned that 
uh, you have to do what's right no matter what as a person. And, you know, there's another very famous quote, C.S. Lewis said, courage is not simply one of the virtues. Mm -hmm. It's the form of every virtue at the testing point. You, you can't have a moral society, an ethical society, without making sure that people understand you must speak out when you see something that's wrong. You must know right from wrong. Uh, and so, yeah. uh, you know, we, I said, you know, uh, one of the things I was criticized for was using the phrase rise up. Rise up means speak up. When you're in a free society, there's a responsibility, not just a, an opportunity to speak up. There's a responsibility of good people, and there are many, uh, mm. to step up, to rise up, to speak up. Because these freedoms disappear. We see how fragile they were. You, you, I mean, there, there's nothing more shocking than what's going on in Canada, frankly, to those of us down here. Uh, but what we need people that are young with courage. My generation and the people, we, we've had a failure. Okay, we had a gross failure here of, of a failure of integrity, of integrity, a failure of courage. We need young people to help sort of reinstate both the ethical compass the knowing right from wrong, but also a basic civility. We have lost basic civility. We have a lot of hate in the United States and I'm sure in Canada too. Uh, we have a divided society. You know, we're, we're forgetting uh, basic human decency. We can't have a society that is filled with people or led by people who refuse to even allow the discussion of views contrary to their own preference. And so we, we need to, uh, we, I think, you know, the society needs people who are young uh, to understand that and, and how to do that. It, it's difficult. I, I think uh, one way is to get involved with other people who who understand the value of freedom uh, and rational thinking uh, and all the things that we yeah. value about having a free society uh, and, and, you know, because it's very difficult to be the, the tip of the spear, as they say. I mean, I, I know how difficult yeah. it is. I, I don't think that was easy at all. Uh, but I do think uh, people, the most important thing that happens, this is something to remember, I think. When you speak out, it doesn't just get something on the record. And the most important part of speaking out is it allows other people to speak out. There are many like-minded yeah. people. In fact, most people are decent people. Most people have a brain. Most people understand one plus one is two. The earth is round. Lockdowns are destructive. Masks don't work. All those things are equal, uh, equivalent. And I think that most people, uh, the value of speaking out, many times people told me was that, okay, they, they said, okay, I agree with that guy. I agree with that. That makes sense. Uh, and I think that's very valuable. So if you understand that you have impact by speaking out, particularly by by inspiring others to speak out, allowing others to speak out, to feel comfortable speaking out, uh, if you remember that, it it sort of re you realize how important individual voices can be. Hmm. Well, so eloquently put, that's, and, uh, that's and what, very well said. Really well said, and what a what a phenomenal way to to wrap up there with such a, an encouraging message for students. So. Um, me and uh, myself and, and Camille, thank you so much there, doctor, and, and for sharing your time with us and, uh, and your wisdom and experience. And I know the students across Canada will, will very much appreciate it. So thank you. Great. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me.